figure out what I did. I'm on mute today. Can you hear me now? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Here. Let's see if I'm on mute. I not hear you. Hot spot of the pandemic. Oh. Honey, I'm in the middle of it. When they say you want to be in the middle of all the action, I didn't know it was going to be all this. Oh my God. This is not what you signed up for. No. And I live right in Times Square, like a block west of it. Okay. So I'm like surrounded by, as I say, respiratory droplets. <laughs> so. Oh my God, Christy. Yeah. Have you had anybody in your family ill with the virus in New York? No, but nobody in immediate family, but a lot of friends, a lot of close friends. Some have died. Some oh, sorry. were very sick and made it. And that was huge. And it's just almost like the luck of the draw. Yeah. So, people I didn't think was going to make it pulled through after a month. And the ones I thought, oh, you're going to beat this, dead five days later. So you just don't know. And out here, I'm in Vegas. And right. out here, people are like, oh, a conspiracy theory. And I want to slap them across the face. <laughs> oh, I'm so, if I hear the word conspiracy theory again, I'm punching everybody. It's so rude. It's, it's just, so rude. This is a hoax. Okay, then why don't you go lick that pole on the subway for 20 minutes, and then let's see if it's a hoax. <laughs> Here's a toilet you can lick. Let me see you. I dare you. <laughs> so I want to hear about you and the world famous comedy store and your roller derby queen. <laughs> oh yes, all fun eras of my life. The comedy store is where I got my start in LA. Because I'm from California. Where in yeah. California are you from? Uh, the Bay Area. Okay. San Francisco. Growing up, we used to call it Sam and Frank's Disco. Because <laughs> it's gay. Yeah. So. <laughs> honey, everybody sucked cock then. It was just, I was like, well, when in Rome, honey, let's do it. And then nobody would let me. So I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> You guys are supposed to be promiscuous. What happened to that? <laughs> so so what I was it to... like coming up the ranks at the comedy store? I want to hear this. Uh, it was probably the best schooling any comedian could ever go through. And to be able to go and I went in, the thing was my best friend and I at the time uh, in LA, she goes, you know, as, as a kid, I wanted to be a comic. I used to watch every stand-up comedy special, like on Showtime, HBO, like when Showtime came out. And they had the comedy specials with HBO, and then they would have the, the, the regular network shows. I watched everything. I think I memorized every Richard Pryor stand-up. I memorized, you know, I memorized everything. And uh, every Eddie Murphy thing, I, I watched all these. And uh, in San Francisco, they had this local show called the San Francisco Laugh Off. And it was a comedy contest. And that's when I saw Marshall Warfield, Ollie Joe Frater, the Reverend George Wallace, Johnny Dark, and all these comics competing. And I was just like mesmerized. I was a little kid. And I was mesmerized. And Marshall Warfield won and went to the next round, her and Ollie Joe Frater. But Marsha, and then there was this guy named Reverend George Wallace. And I said, oh my God, this is what I want to do with my life. This man is everything. So as I grew up, in my 20s, I moved to Los Angeles, because that's what you do in California. <laughs> so, I mean, you're going to be actressing. You know? <laughs> so we all moved to LA, my best friend and I. And she goes, you know, I'm tired of you being hilarious and not doing anything with it. You need to go to the comedy store and at least try an open mic or try to get a job because you're not working now. So I was doing extra work for money. So I was like, well, I go, well, that's a good idea. I go, why don't I go to the comedy store? I'll apply as a waitress. If I get a job as a waitress, that means I'm supposed to be there to learn and grow and do open mics. That's my sign. So I went there and the day manager was there, of course, a big old homo named Dave Schuler. My interview turned into three and a half hours of kiki and laughing. I was hired on the spot. And then I started working this uh, one of the comedy awards after parties.
and that's when I started waitressing. And then uh, Mitzi was known to fire waitresses at the drop of a hat. So she would, if they were blonde, you know, if they were pretty, if she caught them talking to a comedian, they were gone. You weren't allowed to speak to them. I was blonde at the time. Oh, shock. <laughs> and they're like, oh my God, Mitzi's going to hate me. You're going to have to hide. And I'm like, why am I hiding? This is crazy. It made no sense to me. So ended up, you know, I was like, I'm like doing the open mics and stuff. I got my little three minutes together and I was like, okay, this is it. And then uh, that was September of that year I got hired. And then December I did my first open mic and did it. And like every big comic that was there, was there, came upstairs to the Valley Room to watch, to support me. And I actually had a really good set. And I was like, okay, and it felt really good. So that was where it started. So I'm lucky to be surrounded by Paul Mooney, who took me on the road with him for many years. With Andrew Dice Clay, who I get to work with off and on when Eleanor's not around. With uh, <laughs> Saul Wait, Mayer, no, with, with that, Joe Rogan. That's what? hilarious. Yes. <laughs> So I'm being taught as a little baby comic by all these big names. And then, you know, I'm working there, I'm doing employee comedy, and Mitzi loved me. She was like, oh, that's my all-around girl, because cause she liked comics working at the store. And so I was a waitress. I worked the phones. I worked up as an accounting, like assisting in the accounting office. I was an assistant talent coordinator. I was a runner. I was a cover booth. I, mean, I did everything. It was hilarious. So I kind of did everything, worked on my craft, worked, and then I did a showcase, and I got passed. The first time I showcased for her, she goes, oh, she's too black. Oh, God, that was so black. Stop. You're not black. It was hilarious. And Moody's looking at her and goes, well, she was raised in Oakland. What do you want from her? And we're laughing. So... I was like, all right, let me, all right, let me work on more material. So I was working on it and working on it. And I had a, you know, good, like, hour and a half, couple hours at that point. And I was probably, like, four years in. And uh, showcase for her six months later. She loved me, passed me, and then I was getting spots all the time. Wow. So it was, yeah. Tell me about being in roller derby. I mean, that is nothing for lightweight pansy girls. No, no. It was so much fun. When I first moved to New York, I was like, uh, a friend of mine sent me an email. She goes, did you know they have roller derby in New York? And I said, that's still around? And she's like, yes. She goes, oh my God, I saw it on the news and I thought of you. I had to tell you, you have to go find out. I'm like, well, that sounds interesting. I used to roller skate as a kid. Why not? Something different. It's punk rock. It's different. It's fun. So at that moment, I was at the gym and this girl came into the gym and she was wearing a Gotham Girls roller derby shirt. So I grabbed her and I said, where the fuck did you get that shirt? She got scared. <laughs> She's like, what the hell is going on? She goes, oh, they still skate at the, in the Bronx at the skate key. You should check them out. She goes, oh, you'd actually be perfect for them because you're big and scary. Like, you know, the joke. So then I went online, looked them up, signed up for auditions, went out, went out for the auditions, did all the drills. Got, got recruited, put into the draft, and I skated two seasons on the Manhattan Mayhem. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Now, today we have, like, um, the Kardashians. They're the, the biggest thing since sliced bread or butts or whatever. Yep. In my day, we had Raquel Welch. Yes. And she was in that roller derby movie. She was. I have that movie. What? I have the movie <laughs> on DVD. <Yeah. laughs> so when they were filming that, she came to Portland, Oregon, where I was working at the airport, and I was in a gift shop selling candy and magazines. I was in charge of magazines. That's how much they trusted me with inanimate <laughs> around Christmas time and I was like you got it I told the somebody came to buy stuff for her at the gift shop I said please tell her hello that's as close as I ever got to roller derby that's what I'm saying oh that's so close yeah we had when I was a kid we had the San Francisco Bay Bombers they were a big derby team yes and uh the rules changed a lot because like they tried to make it when they put it on Saturday mornings 
you know, the roller derby games at the garden. They changed everything. It was full bank track. And bank track means it's suspended up. That's the one that people are most familiar with is the bank track. Yeah. We, I skated flat track uh, here in New York because A, there's nowhere to put a bank track. Those things are huge. And B, if the sport court, if you have to, you can break it apart, put it on the truck, and then bring it back and put it back together. It takes a lot of work, but it's a portable track. And it's like, like this plastic, it's called sport court. So we put the padding underneath and we snap them together like puzzle pieces and build a track to not ruin the gymnasium because the skate key closed down in 2006 due to violations. And yeah, they, uh, there was a lot of injuries, but the skate, all their, pro, all their equipment was not up to par. So kids were getting hurt on the roller skates. It was a huge, like, I used to call it, uh, I used to call it Baghdad around there because it was just gunshots and drug dealers and empty lots and storage units. So there was a lot up there. So it was kind of free reign for gangs in the South Bronx not a good area. As soon as you're from the skate key to the five train, we would fucking haul ass from the, and, uh, but the skate key was huge and beautiful. So we had a home, then we lost it when they closed down. So we had to start skating in skate parks. Then we ended up renting a cigar warehouse out in Queens. And then we bought the sport court, but the sport court enabled us to travel with it to venues. So like the Long Island University Schwartz Athletic Center that seats 2000 people. We did a lot of our games there. We did it at Hunter College Sportplex, which sat, I think it was 1,200, 1,100 to 1,200 people, a little smaller. And then we had CCNY in Harlem, City College of New York. They had their uh, Nat Holman Gymnasium, which was really big and spacious, but they just had bleachers that moved in and out, so it was kind of an awkward setup. But it was still a space, so we lay our sport court down. We did all the work ourselves. The two teams that weren't skating that week did all the work, all the production, so the teams that were skating could be rested and ready and, and get prepared for the bout. And then the next games, you know, we just it rotated in. It was fun. We, we all looked out for each other, and it was a lot of fun. It's so a lot of work. Let's go back to you as a comedian and an actress. Tell me some of the high points in your acting and your comedy life. Hmm. I got to work on a movie called Strange Days when I first went to L.A., because uh, a friend of mine was working on it. It was with Ray Fiennes, Angela Bassett, Juliet Lewis, Tom Sizemore, directed by Catherine Bigelow. And it was about virtual, yeah, it was about virtual reality. Like, you know, with the VR glasses and the future, and it was about, it was, they witnessed a murder in the VR glasses and they were trying to prevent it, and it was crazy. So she was working on it, and they wanted to get a group, so I got a job as an extra. And it was like all these crazy, like I had to go into hair and makeup all the time and get crazy, because it's like set in the future, so it's all futuristic, kind of like a human Star Wars-y kind of thing. It was, it was really fun. And Catherine is a perfectionist. That woman is an incredible director. She has such an eye, but she's so meticulous. And the biggest joke was, okay, that's perfect. Now let's go again. And you'd have to do the take like 17, 20 times. Then they ended up realizing because of the extras of the crowd scenes, because it was set on New Year's, that some of the extras were being too crazy and getting too close to the principal. So they uh, created a like a small stunt group to buffer the stuntmen because the stuntmen couldn't do their job with these extras bombarding them. They didn't know how to act. So there was a stunt group created like action extras is what they call that Catherine called them. So we created a, a buffer for the stuff. Now, clean, so I can <laughs> leave. So there's been a few instances where, oh God, this had to be back at the improv in LA. I'll never forget. There was this guy in the audience kind of drunk, heckling every comic and they were backing down. And, like, and letting him win and trying not to, because you know, it's the improv, it's the stuffy improv, you know, you gotta be English on It wasn't like the comedy store, it was like a jazz club where anything went happen. So I had a spot that night and people were just banging these comments. This guy was banging comments after and after and after and after. And I was getting mad. I was mad, like, come on, fuck him up, right? And I'm sitting back, like going crazy. So they bring me up and this was around the whole, like 
Clinton, Lewinsky, you know, scandal. And he said something to me and I looked at him <laughs> and I said, honey, I wish I had a dick right now. I, got, I said, said, I wish Bill Clinton was here right now so he could stick his dick in your mouth and shut you the fuck up. And the whole place erupted. And I said, but the good thing is you might get a purse line out of it. Hey, you know, and I just went on with my act. He didn't say another word. It was something to that effect. Like I slammed him down, went on with my act. Off stage, because at the improv, you come off center stage and you cut to the left and there's the doors. So I'm walking towards the door. There's the dude standing at the double doors, waiting. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Right? He grabs me, and then we walk out. He walks out the double doors with me, and he grabs me. He's like, oh, my God, you were the only one who could shut me up. You just destroyed me, because I just nailed him down hard. And I'm like, oh, i never been, uh, you know, congratulated by a heckler before. This is odd. <laughs> you know? He goes, you were, he's like, I was waiting for someone to destroy me. I just wanted to be destroyed. And you were the only one who did it. Um, I'm like, aw, well, I'll do it again, so keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> Love to destroy him. One time I was at Broadway. I think I performed twice there when I've been in New York. Mm -hmm. There was a lady in the front row, and I wasn't going fast enough for her happy ass. <laughs> <laughs> and so she does that thing, like, come on. Oh, like, wrap it up? Oh. And I said, oh. Honey, you better check my record. You might want to slow your roll. <laughs> and then I got outside later, you know, and I, I was afraid the club was going to ban me from being there. So I asked Dina and, and Rob and, you know, should I have yeah. done that? And they were like, fine with it. But I was scared. After I did it, I got scared. Aw. That's one thing about Broadway. When hecklers come in, they don't, on the weekends, they have security because they're so busy. But during the week, there's no security, so it's kind of like you against them. And if a heckler comes, because I, I, I close every Tuesday nights there as a tradition, so I'm the closing comic every Tuesday. And there is, if they come for you, you can destroy them, and they'll throw them out. But I'm not afraid of anybody, because my mom taught me. She goes, "If you're gonna go down, go down with a fight. If someone comes for you, you fight, because you just might win." And I'm a little intimidating on stage anyway, and I'm really self-deprecating. And I roast myself as, a, as also pop culture and anything like that I will destroy. So when they heckle me, I will go in on them. And then I will, I'm like, step out. I'm like, I pull the total cash me out, I have our dad kind of attitude. And they never do. <laughs> but I've never, I've only had one I'm going to say one heckler that was so drunk and mean that wanted to start a fight with me where I came off the stage in the middle of my set and looked for him outside. Wow. Only, and that's in 24 years. And even with the four years break taking, playing roller derby, it was the only one time that I got off that I hunted the person down because wow. they threatened. But, so that's a pretty good record. That is really good. Because usually hecklers are fun and usually... When someone heckles me, I'll turn it around and make them to be the hero and me the asshole to shut them up. That's a great tip. Yeah, I will, instead of like being angry and attacking them, I will usually, like the, like the old improv um, rule, yes and everything. So I will usually yes and them, slam them with their own joke, but still be about me being an asshole. That's one thing I learned all those years opening for Paul Mooney, because his fans are some of the most diehard, incredibly loyal, loving, Mooney worshiping, brilliant people. And when they love Mooney, they love him. And they don't give a shit who's on before. Get off. We want Mooney. Wow. How did and, you handle that? Oh, uh, it, it, uh, I took some bumps and bruises on the way, you know? <laughs> I got a few knockouts. You know, I came out with a couple black eyes, you know, <laughs> and, and, a, and a knot, stronger, right? but it made me stronger. I learned so much about myself and about the audiences and about their reflection of me that one night I got to a point, it was like in the beginning, like, you know, I got beaten up a few times. I don't care if I bomb or you hate me. I'm still going to do it. I don't care. And I'm very committed. So one night it was in the Mooney show, it was packed, and at Caroline's, the seats are long this way off the stage. 
so they seat long ways so you can seat more people in. And when I went on stage, there was this black girl and her boyfriend sitting in the front. And the boyfriend's sitting like this watching the show because the stage is right there. The microphone's right there. She sees me and does this. Oh my God. And she won't move. So I'm just opening up doing some jokes and her boyfriend's laughing. She's kind of getting mad at her like, doing like, what are you doing? And I lean down behind her head and I said, honey, don't worry. I'm not fat enough to fuck your boyfriend. The whole club erupts, erupts. Ah, <laughs> uh, they were going, yeah, oh shit, she just said that. They were going crazy. And then eventually that bitch turned around and relaxed. But it was so, it was such a read, like, bitch, I'm not fat enough to fuck your man, sorry. <laughs> but I, it was just so subtle. I couldn't help it. And at that point, I was like, that was early in my Mooney career. I was like, fuck them. They want to come for me. I got gun, gun blazing, bitch. Let's, <laughs> let's roast. Let's roast back and forth. Let's do it. Because I can take a joke. I love to be roasted. There's nothing funnier when someone roasts me. I think when it's brilliant and smart, I am dead on the floor laughing. I love so, it. Oh, I love it. Like if you if you can come for me, you, you make me fucking laugh my ass off. Like I laugh harder when they roast me than when I roast somebody else. Yeah. Like it's it's so much fun. So when they come for me in Mooney's room, oh, I would just destroy him. Or I'd beat him to the punch. Huh? I have a lot of jokes that beat them to the punch. And it kind of disarms the audience going, all right, we're going to go with this bitch. We don't know her, but let's go with her. And then yeah. I usually win. Yeah. It's just experience. That's really great tips there. I'll tell you, that's worth a million bucks. <laughs> what do you have? Watch out. <laughs> you got right. What do you have planned for getting out of the pandemic? What do you have coming up that got put on hold? Oh, I um, a couple things that got put on hold show wise. Um, at Westside Comedy Club, I was doing a late night Saturday show. Uh, called Wild Wild West. It was the first Saturday of every month. That got put on hold, and I have a feeling that's not going to stay at Westside Comedy Club once the pandemic is over. So I'm going to have to move that show. Uh, it's a late night, falls out, crazy comedy. Um, it's me. I'm the producer and creator of it, along with Gina Savage, who's no longer at Westside anymore. She left. And then um, I, Gino Visconti does it with me. He's one of my staples. And he's on Compound Media on In Hot Water with Aaron Berg. And he's got his Gino's picks. He does like a lot of sports um, commentating. Yeah. He's really funny, really dark and twisted, but he's he makes me laugh because he's nuts. <laughs> and, and, and he's such a good guy. And then uh, my friend Eric Marino is a staple in it where he hosts it. He was a writer on Saturday Night. I have to fast forward. It, it didn't tape correctly. So. really out there. Because V-Box I was using because it was... This is her podcast. My friend Roxanne owns it. And it was My computer messed up. And get out all the kinks and stuff for a one-hour show. So I'm doing all the engineering myself. There's no video. It's all audio. But I'm doing running the soundboard or the computer and the mics. I don't take phone calls because I'm only, only one person. If I had a, an engineer with me, I could do it. I think phone calls ruin the flow of the show. And then we have a comic on every week as a guest, as our in-studio guest. So it's become like a really cute little... I'm going to have to fast forward and get... live a lot lately that we can't use the studio. And JC's mom... This is about her podcast. I got it on the page. It'll be me commentating and Michael K will, and them will be muted. And I'll be doing the commentating on the games. Well, there's no baseball yet, so that's on hold. So I'm doing... This is really cool what she's Friday doing. RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I commentate live on RuPaul's Drag Race as it airs. This is so cool. You can go on and commentate yeah, so on sports of all kinds. Free and use my code Christy five two four when they sign up. I get credit for it, and then you can listen to that. You can watch any commentator. You can follow me on there. There's a lot of other comics on there. Amory got me on there. Amory Castillo, uh, Gina Visconti's on there. There's a, quite a few of us. They're doing like football and basketball stuff. I'm just waiting for baseball because I want to do Yankee games. 
That's my that's my thing. So, so cool. It's an advice bomb and watch guys tuck their baseballs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love watching sports and making wisecracks, so that yeah. will be fun for me to watch. I'll come yes. and watch you. Yes, I will let you know when the Yankees actually start That's playing. That's hot mic. July, they announced the that she's talking about. July. Nobody's going to be in the stands, so they're just going to be playing. So then I'm just going to do what I do, just get my stats together for the players in that game and the lineups, and then go off on the stats and do it my way, which I usually do it at the baseball field anyway. I would go to a game and be with my friends and start roasting and heckling. And then the whole seats around me would be dying laughing. I'm like, what else is she gonna say? So I'm like, I should be commentating like comedy wise. Like, yeah, we'll have the stats, but why not make fun of it? Why not roast them, you know, or, or praise them or just heckle them? Let's yeah. just have fun and make it, you know, just a, a different experience. You know, Sounds so fun. Is when you watch a baseball game, no, I lied, basketball, watching basketball, and they're not stealing the ball from each other. And I'm like, come on, you bunch of pussies. Do you want send in the M W N B A? You know, right? And these got balls. Right? They're not worried about grabbing balls, man. <laughs> so now <laughs> mine, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> because That's in the NBA, you might grab a ball, and be like, oh, sorry, bro, I didn't mean to hit the sack. <laughs> it looks exactly the same. They're the same size. <laughs> 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 My bad. <laughs> Tell me what it's like to travel with Andrew Dice and open for him. Oh, heaven. That's cool. Heaven. Andrew and I have been friends for, God, since my whole career, since I started, for 25 years. And he's always been so good to me. And he's been like an older brother and like a protector. And he did an album many years ago called Face Down, Ass Up. And he calls me one day and he goes, Christy. How do you feel about showing your ass on the album cover? <laughs> like, why? <laughs> you know, why not? <laughs> Sorry about having to hold a camera, but it goes, you know sent it somewhere wrong. It like, looks really cool. And I'm like, yeah. I go, you know, my buddy Slim Jim Phantom has the Cat Club on Sunset Boulevard. I used to do shows there. I used to call, I used to do my own show there on Wednesdays. It's called the One Woman Wrecking Crew because I was such a bad you know, on stage. <laughs> and then I'd have a couple, like Sam Tripoli and Stevie D would work with me on the show and do the shows. And I'd have musicians open or whatever, but it's just a cool vibe. Slim Jim from the Stray Cats is probably one of the nicest people I've ever known in my entire life. So I call Slim and I go, dude, Dice want, I go, you have like a lot of leopard all around. This is very cool. And this is something Dice would be into for his album. Would you let him shoot it here? And he goes, oh, my kids play uh, softball with his kids. Fuck yeah. He's on here during the day. Just doing the books, have at it. The club is yours. Whatever you want, it's yours. Don't even worry about it. So, called Dias and said, Slim's giving us the club. So, we went over and set up. It was two porn chicks and me. And he was making them do all the nasty things. And every time in between, he would stand in front of me like this and block me because I was in a bikini. Don't look at her. <laughs> was but he's such a protector. And then going on the road with him, he treats you like a princess. Oh. Right? He gives you the world. And... He's just, he's just such a good friend, and I'm so blessed to have him. And that's why I'm like, come on, Eleanor, keep getting bigger so I can scoot on in, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Eleanor's a riot. And it, her and I were waitresses together at the comedy store back in the day. Yeah, so well, it's like Eleanor, our family. Eleanor came to Portland, Oregon when I was at Harvey's Comedy Club. Uh-huh. And I, I was teaching comedy, you know, because that's what you do when you've been doing it for five years. Right. <laughs> Such a read. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> oh, I love you. I want that as a sound clip. <laughs> and have it. Take it. Oh, and everybody would walk in the door and go, when can I have a Netflix special? And I'm like, I haven't got mine yet. I've been in for five years. I don't know. But, but, so I was doing all kinds of things like you did, you know, at the club. And Eleanor, I always wore a prom gown to everything. That's my shtick. I right. wear a prom gown. And okay. how else are you going to be relatable? And so. Oh. Uh, <laughs> it's casual Friday. <laughs> <laughs> and Eleanor just fell in love with me just before yep. I even gave her a hug. She was like, oh, you're a doll. <laughs> yep, that's Eleanor. That's my thing. I love my L. 
Elle's the, ba Elle's the greatest. Man, she's so funny. I went and caught her at um, the last actor here in Vegas when she opened for Andrew Dice. Mm -hmm. Larry, she's just as funny as Andrew Dice with the crap. Oh, she's such a good storyteller that I'm like, fuck. You know, she's such a great storyteller. I don't tell stories. I'm not good at them. Mm -hmm. I tell rants. And I roast everything that in, in life, I just roast it. And that's my thing. I wish I could tell stories like she does. I'm like, I don't even like my family enough to remember anything we did together. <laughs> who? I'm sorry, you're who? My mom? I don't know who the fuck you are. Girl, you're just a fan. You need to step off. You know? <laughs> but she has such an amazing gift of telling stories, and that's a huge deal. Yes. Yes, it is. Well, yes. gosh, you've been a doll. I will Aww. post the video. I mean, it's going live right now. Right. And uh, when it gets finalized and up there, and I don't know how to talk, then I'll go in <laughs> and I'll put all this information you gave me and check it because I don't know if you noticed I'm old as fuck. <laughs> You're 39. <laughs> Times two. And I'm, I just turned 69, and I didn't know what to do for my birthday because I was in my. Next! <laughs> Check the accuracy and share. Okay, sure. Now, how do you? I, I want to talk to you 